Welcome everyone and thank you for jo joining us for February's edition of the 2017 Educational Webinar Series. My name is Lori and I will be your moderator for today. Today's meeting is all about attracting health conscious guests and what you can do as a food service operator to successfully provide this information to consumers. Before we get started, I want to go ahead and take you through a couple of housekeeping items. We will be muting you during today's webinar so you won't have to worry about the background noise wherever you're watching today. On your screen, you'll see a small chat box. Please use the chat box to type in any questions you have as we go through the slides today. And at the end of the webinar, we will be able to get those questions answered for you. We should have plenty of time for questions, so please don't be shy. If for any reason the audio goes out during today's webinar, just stay on the line and you will be placed into a lobby and reconnected once we get the audio backed up, back up. If you happen to lose the connection on your end, just dial back in and you'll be placed right back into the webinar. And finally, we will be recording the webinar today, but we will not be making the slides available as a PDF. So please take notes and ask questions to make sure you can take all this information back to your brand. Um, and the webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and read our disclaimer in its entirety. The content shown here is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. We are not lawyers and do not claim to be. You are encouraged to verify any and all parts of this presentation with your own brand's legal counsel. Menu Trinco will not be held responsible for fines or penalties that arise from recommendations that were made following our best understanding of all published laws and supplemental guidance documents. This webinar contains material protected under international and federal copyright laws and treaties. Any unauthorized reprint or use of any kind of this material is prohibited. No part of this webinar may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic or mechanical, including photocopying, recording, or by any information storage and retrieval system without expressed written permission from Menutrinfo LLC, the author and publisher. Before we dive into the content of today's webinar, we'd like to give you a little bit of background on our company, Menutrinfo. Menutrinfo is a mashup of the words menu, nutrition, information, which really describes what we do. We are a full service nutrition consultant to the industry. We provide nutrition information through our proprietary software and database, as well as allergen identification, gluten-free menu reviews, specialty menu development, and menu labeling consulting. We also have the only ANSI-accredited food allergy training program in the nation through Allertrain. The Allertrain suite of courses are designed to cater to various food service professionals and settings, including restaurant managers, hourly employees, chefs, university dining halls, university resident advisors, and primary and secondary school staff. Our courses teach food service professionals how to better serve diners with special dietary needs, including food allergies, food intolerance, and celiac disease. Various course delivery options are available, including e-learning, live taught by a certified master trainer, or via live webinar. And finally, a newer branch for us encompasses our gluten-free and food allergy audits. Stay tuned for for some exciting announcements this year regarding that service line. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without our incredible clients, and we have a handful of you on the webinar today, so thank you all for joining. This slide shows you just a few of the incredible brands we've had the honor of working with. We want to keep the sales talk to a minimum here, but if after this webinar you are interested in learning more about our services or what a nutrition partnership with us looks like, please feel free to give us a call and we'll be sending out an email afterwards today with our contact information and would love to hear from you. With all the housekeeping tasks behind us, let's go ahead and dive into the webinar. Our speaker today is Claire Willis. She's the Director of Nutrition at Menu Trinfo. She's been with the company for over four and a half years and has seen the full growth and evolution of menu labeling and other food-related legislation during that time. She has led dozens of menu labeling webinars, as well as privately hosted menu labeling workshops by brands across the country. Part of the menu labeling process has been working with clients to improve the nutritional values of their menu items and to meet the demands of an ever-changing public opinion of health and wellness. She looks forward to sharing some tricks and tips with you when it comes to offering lighter and more healthful options and how to avoid misleading guests with this information. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Claire. 
Thank you, Lori, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us here today for our lighter, heavier traffic webinar. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start off with a poll. Um, so if you could use that chat box on your screen to type in your answer. Um, I'm curious, what does healthy mean to you, um, either as a food service operator or as a consumer? Um, when you see that word, what do you think of? And while you go ahead and type in your answers, I'm going to move ahead to the next slide um, where we'll talk about what healthy means to the FDA. Healthy is a defined claim. Um, it was defined back in 1993. And there are specific values, but overall it has to be low in total fat, low in saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, and contain at least 10% of the daily value of uh, vitamins A, C, calcium, iron, protein, or fiber. Um, so things have changed quite a bit since 1993. There's been quite a bit of uh, new nutrition research. The public's opinions on certain nutrients is changing. Um, so maybe that definition isn't as accurate as it used to be. So I'm sure quite a few of you uh, have heard of the Kynebar lawsuit. Um, back in March of 2015, the FDA sent a warning letter to the Kind LLC company. Um, they had a number of complaints, um, the use of plus signs, the use of the word antioxidant without providing enough information. Um, and a big one was that they used the term healthy to describe some of their products that were higher in total fat and some in saturated fat um, due to the nut content of their bars. So Kynebar um, obviously tried to defend their stance and their use of the word healthy. Um, and in May of 2016, the FDA reversed their stance and allowed Kind to use healthy as part of their corporate messaging. So they weren't necessarily allowing it as a health claim, um, but they would allow Kynebar to use healthy on their packaging. So as a result of that lawsuit, um, or excuse me, not lawsuit, um, that action that the FDA took, um, they've decided to look at that 13-year-old healthy definition and see if there are some changes that should be made there. So they opened the comment period last year and have extended it to April of this year. So I'd like to um, let you guys know some of the answers that you typed in. Um, clean labels, low sodium, low calories, low cholesterol, uh, balanced meal, moderation. We all love that M word for all the nutritionists and dietitians on the call. Um, healthy means... Um, food allergy safety, food safety, um, nutritionally dense, whole foods, less additives, um, not so concerned about macronutrients, um, only 10% of the population sodium sensitive. Um, so some really great answers coming through. Thank you guys for your thoughts there. So I mentioned that the FDA opened up a comment period for use of the term healthy. Um, all comments are public, so I went on the website and just grabbed a handful um, to see what people were saying. A couple of different people said that healthy should not be used on food labels. Um, some people said that uh, healthy should mean grown or raised naturally in nature, not in the lab. Food as it occurs in nature. Um, healthy food that can be used as medicine to treat the ailing health of developed nations which have fallen victim to the marketing of food produced by big food corporations. You can imagine how many of the comments became political. Uh, healthy food that is grown sustainably near me without the use of chemicals. And then finally, I would like to see a reasonable amount of calories per serving if a food product is to be labeled healthy. So what do all of these comments mean? Well, first of all, it means that the FDA has a tough job ahead. There was not um, a lot of consistency between the answers that people gave. So the FDA trying to create a definition that uh, make so many people happy and um, fulfills what they think healthy should mean um, is going to be a very difficult job. Number two, it also means that consumers might be confused when it comes to different food marketing claims. Um, a good example is chemical free. This is something that we see a lot. Um, as a nutrition help desk, our clients send us questions that they receive from guests. Um, and just over the past, I don't know, year to 18 months, we've gotten an increase in the question, um, which of your food is chemical free? And I'm sure that these people mean pesticides, herbicides, um, but r really anything is a chemical, water is a chemical. So use of that term um, is a little bit misleading and maybe consumers don't totally know what that means. And third, it means that consumers are looking beyond fat and sodium and they want the FDA to do the same when it comes to healthy definitions. And thank you to the person who agreed in the comment box that um, water is a chemical. Hate the scare of chemicals. Um, that's a great point. 
So with all this being said, um, when it comes to offering healthier options, there are really two different approaches that we see being used in the industry. The first um, relies on FDA definitions for nutrient content and health claims, and the second dives a little bit deeper, and instead of focusing on certain nutrients, it goes into avoidance of certain ingredients, clean eating, we put clean in quotes, um, we'll go into that a little bit uh, further on in the webinar, and trending diets. So let's start off with the FDA-defined claims. Uh, these are certainly the easiest to figure out, um, and they probably used to be the most popular option, and they still are very commonly used. But there's been a shift in priorities when it comes to food marketing that we'll discuss later on. So here are the nutrients that the FDA has defined. Um, you can see that these are considered more nutrients to limit. So it makes sense that the FDA has determined low or reduced values for these items. Um, I do want to mention that the FDA does have other defined claims like structure function claims, um, so fiber and gut health, um, and relative claims. I just went to Trader Joe's over the weekend and bought a bag of pita chips, and it had a huge symbol on the front that said 50% less fat than potato chips. So comparing one food to a different food, um, to show its nutritional superiority. That's something that the FDA controls as well. Um, but since those are used more in a retail setting, we're just going to focus on these nutrient content claims. So here's just a handful of examples from the industry. Um, you can see that the majority of these focus on calories. It's difficult for me to find anything that focused on fat. Um, like we mentioned earlier, fat isn't quite the... Um, dietary enemy that it used to be. Um, people are having a better relationship with dietary fat, um, so the lower fat options aren't quite as popular as they used to be. Um, it was also difficult finding sodium and sugar claims, uh, certainly with uh, smoothie concepts, um, saying that their smoothies are 100% fruit, no added sugar, those types of things are popular. Um, but there's a big one here, if you think back to that list of defined nutrients, there's a big one that's missing from the list. And I'm not sure if you uh, noticed it or not. If you did, go ahead and type into the chat box which big nutrient you thought was missing. And I'll cut the suspense here. Uh, it's carbohydrates. So the FDA views total carbohydrates as a more beneficial nutrient, so they haven't defined low or reduced values. Um, think of it as being a food marketed as low in vitamins or low in fiber. That's not something that you would see. So the FDA has taken the same approach with total carbs. No carbs, carb-free, and low carb are all unauthorized claims. I can tell you that the FDA has conducted a few studies um, to see what consumers think when they see low carb on a food, um, trying out some different claims and maybe introducing those in the future. But right now, carbohydrate claims um, actually aren't uh, defined at all. So. If you are looking to make carbohydrate claims, which are definitely becoming more and more popular with the higher fat, lower carb diets, the best way to go around this um, is to say X grams per serving, since that's just stating a fact. A guest could look at your additional nutrition information and find that carbohydrate value. So using the terms low carb or carb free, it's a little bit trickier um, and a little bit riskier for your organization. And while nutrient content claims may be taking a backseat to some other health-related claims that we'll get to, they aren't going away anytime soon, and that's because of menu labeling. Uh, the enforcement date for menu labeling is May 5th of this year. It's 66 days away, um, and that's really going to be putting nutrition front and center, um, or for those of you familiar with the guidelines, adjacent and conspicuous. Um, so the having the calorie information posted on a menu board, there's definitely the possibility of some sticker shock. We get that a lot um, with consumers not knowing with restaurant food, higher portions, um, fattier options, the numbers are going to be pretty big. And so I think consumers seeing that for the first time, it might freak them out a little bit. Um, so some ways to help that and to curb that fear from consumers, um, first is to be aware of your standard build. So when you post calories and have additional nutrition information available for your menu items, you need to post it for the way that it is served to the guest. So if you serve 
salad dressing on the side, but it's four fluid ounces of salad dressing, uh, you still have to post that entire information, all four fluid ounces, um, to the guest, which can lead to some pretty monumental numbers. Um, if you provide ketchup with french fries, you need to include that. Um, anything that's being served to the guest as part of the standard build, you're going to need to label calories and have additional nutrition information available. Um, which leads us into that next bullet point. It's not just calories that guests will be looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there, the additional nutrition information, that's where all the macronutrients um, as well as sodium, um, those nutrients are going to be located. So a guest looking to maybe reduce those values um, just because they aren't interested in the calorie information doesn't mean they won't be looking for some other nutrients. And the overall impact of menu labeling on consumers is not yet known. There have been a lot of competing studies that have come out, um, and they keep coming out. Some say that menu labeling makes a big difference in what consumers order, and some studies say that, oh, no, it doesn't make a difference, or some consumers even order more calories after seeing the information. And the big thing to know is that the guests aren't eating just one time a day. There are other eating occasions that happen before or after they go out to the restaurant. So we think that menu labeling, um, its impact is going to be greatest with those other meals. So maybe someone goes out to dinner and eats a really fatty cheeseburger and some french fries, um, but they planned on it for the rest of their, or they planned on it earlier in the day, um, eating a lighter breakfast and lunch, not snacking so much, knowing that they were going to have more calories later on. So how do you accommodate the diners whose opinion of healthy relies on calorie, fat, and sodium content? The first thing to know is that you don't need to overhaul your entire menu. You don't need to change your favorites, the things that guests come to you for. Um, that's not the goal of menu labeling. That's not the goal of providing healthy options. Um, you can still keep those items on your menu, but just making some small changes can add up to a pretty big difference. Keep an eye on packaged foods. I think we're um, constantly surprised by the nutritional content of some of the packaged foods that um, our clients purchase and use. So if you form a relationship with your supplier and let them know, hey, these are our goals for providing healthier options, could you maybe help me find some lower calorie bread options? Or um, if you ever have to substitute a condiment, make sure that it follows these nutritional criteria. So having that um, is part of your tool toolkit when it comes to creating healthier options is important. Probably the easiest thing you can do to reduce the calories, fat, sodium of your menu items is to reduce the portions. So having pick two options is a great way to show half portions um, of some of your heavier menu items and maybe a guest says, okay, I really want that turkey club, but I see that it's 700 calories. Instead of having the french fries that I would have usually picked, I'm going to go with the half salad. I'm going to reduce my meal to less than 1,000 calories opposed to the 1,800 that it would have been if I got the full sandwich and the full fries. Uh, that's really been a popular option that we've seen recently. Offering multiple sizes. So maybe your standard is um, 8 ounces of french fries, um, but you can have people go down to 6 or 4 ounces um, and they'd save a little bit of money and get less calories, that can definitely be something appealing to those guests that they want to eat healthy, but they don't want to give up all of their favorite options. Um, and then finally, side swaps. So you don't always have to offer fried sides, maybe introducing a steamed vegetable or a side salad with a lighter dressing, um, just something where you don't have to mess with your core recipes, but you're giving guests more options when it comes to eating out and healthier options. So we have a sample recipe here. Um, we went with a chef salad. In our recipe, before we made any changes, we have a hard-boiled egg, two ounces of turkey deli meat, two ounces of ham, two ounces of shredded cheddar, two slices of bacon, a third of a cup of purchased croutons, and three fluid ounces of bottled ranch dressing. And maybe that ranch dressing, um, I know three fluid ounces seems like a lot. Maybe it's served on the side, but again, because of menu labeling, we're labeling the standard build which is the entire three fluid ounce portion. So 
before we make any changes, we're at 870 calories and 3,140 milligrams of sodium. And those aren't the prettiest numbers, definitely the sodium. That could freak out some consumers. So in our after recipe, after we make a few changes, um, we stick with the one hard-boiled egg. Instead of turkey deli meat, which is highly processed, high in sodium, we're switching to two ounces of grilled chicken breast that's seasoned. Um, we did include salt here. Two ounces of lower sodium sliced ham. Again, that's something, speaking with your supplier, maybe they can lead you to some lower sodium options. We've been seeing more and more of those. Uh, restaurants are using lower sodium versions of uh, meats for their standard build, not even if guests just request them. Instead of shredded cheddar, we're going with half an ounce less of Julianne Swiss cheese, which is a much lower sodium option. Instead of two slices of bacon, we're going with one slice, but we're going to be chopping it really fine so that way it's more distributed throughout the salad. Um, if you chop it into just four big chunks, the guest is probably going to notice that they're getting half as much, but if you finely chop it, that's a good way to um, distribute the ingredient more and make it seem like you're getting a little bit more. Instead of the purchase croutons, we're going with some fresh made, um, just some old bread that we have, and then we can limit the amount of salt that's being added. And then we're going to make a ranch dressing, reducing it again by just a half a fluid ounce. You'd be surprised how big that difference can be. Um, and we're going to use yogurt and buttermilk with a reduced sodium dressing packet. So after all of those changes, we get down to 380 calories and 1,290 milligrams of sodium. Uh, so certainly, especially with that sodium number, there are still some improvements that could be made, but just some seemingly easy swaps. Um, obviously, you're going to have to work with your supplier to get a few of these items, um, but you're not taking away from the overall integrity of the dish. Um, the guest still views it as a chef salad, but the nutrition is quite a bit better. We also want to touch on a buffet example. Um, so in our before buffet, uh, the start of the line is some prepared Caesar and Asian salads. So instead of loading up their plates with vegetables, they're going to be loading up on these salads that are pre-tossed in dressing, um, you know, croutons, wonton strips. There's not so much room for the lighter stuff later on. So in the after, we're going to start off our buffet with the fresh vegetables. The before buffet, we have iceberg lettuce, and the after, we're going to have a variety of salad base options, um, not only iceberg, but mixed greens and spinach as well. The before buffet, we have a chopped vegetable mix, um, so say tomatoes, carrots, and bell peppers. Uh, this is something that I've seen on a few different buffets. So maybe a consumer doesn't like tomatoes, and because of that, they aren't going to grab that vegetable mix. So in our after buffet, we're going to lift uh, offer all of our vegetables separately in different bins. In our before buffet, we have four fluid ounce scoops for the prepared salads, um, the pasta, coleslaw, and potato. In our after buffet, we're going to use a slightly smaller scoop, um, so that way the guest doesn't feel like they need to dish out a full four fluid ounces. Maybe they want a smaller amount. This is also beneficial for menu labeling. For self-serve food, you have to list the calories for um, the prepared, or the utensil being used to serve the food. So opposed to listing calories for four fluid ounces, we're going to be listing it for two. So aut automatic improvement in calories there. Instead of using salted seeds and nuts, we're going to be using unsalted. Again, another uh, utensil change from two fluid ounce ladles to one fluid ounce. And then instead of having big bins, um, big trays of self-serve desserts like puddings or cobblers, the desserts are going to be pre-portioned into four fluid ounce bowls, so that way the guests can pick one up um, and maybe not load up half their plate with those items. Um, and overall, as you start to go down the line and add these things up, um, there's going to be a pretty considerable difference to the guests by the time they get to the end of the buffet um, with the options before or after we made those changes. Okay, so let's dive into special diets and eating trends. And here's where guests are really starting to pay attention when it comes to dining out. The numbers don't lie. Guests are trying uh, new diets out more than ever because they're looking to find new ways to improve their overall well-being. And the statistics listed here are from a 2016 Nielsen survey entitled, What's in our food and on our mind? And you can see that 32% of adults have tried different approaches to dieting within the past year. 
So most of these reflect around the avoidance of certain ingredients, um, animal products, paleo, there's a whole list of things to avoid there, lactose-free and gluten-free. Um, guests are really looking to eliminate certain ingredients from their diet. So I have another poll question here, and again, if you could type it into the chat box, that would be great. Um, as a food service operator, what is the most common special dietary request that you receive? Um, or what do you request when you dine out? Are there certain ingredients you're trying to avoid or certain dining trends you like to follow? Um, go ahead and type those into the chat box. And we're getting quite a few answers here. Um, gluten-free, 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 dairy-free, vegetarian, peanut tree nut-free, another gluten-free, vegetarian, low-carb, gluten-free, gluten-free. Okay, so I can tell what the most popular option is. So here's a cool graphic from that same Nielsen study that I mentioned before. And these little charts show the percentage of respondents who avoid certain ingredients or follow a specific diet. Um, so we can see, surprisingly, the gluten-free is only 8%, even though that's the vast majority of what you guys typed into the box. Um, it's also interesting to see the breakdown based on geographical location. Um, so obviously, halal is much more important in Africa and the Middle East than it is here in North America. Um, but you can see that the numbers of guests uh, looking to eat out following a specific diet, um, it, it's substantial. So for the people that answered yes to these categories, their thoughts on what's healthy will likely heavily depend on the presence or absence of those specific ingredients. And while we're on the topic of special dietary requests, uh, it's a great time to bring up food allergies and their increasing prevalence in our society. Uh, here's some pretty staggering statistics about food allergies. Um, you can see that they're on the rise. Um, it's becoming more and more common in our society for someone to have a food allergy. So if you're not being asked about food allergies yet, there's a good chance that you'll be questioned in the future. So it's important to be prepared for those requests um, and that they be taken seriously have allergen charts available, um, reliable, dependable allergen charts, and make sure that your staff is trained um, to know that food allergies are something to be taken very seriously. So for these guests um, whose idea of healthy revolves around a specialty diet, what's the best way to attract and maintain their business? And the first step, like I mentioned before, is to take all of their requests seriously. You never know when someone's asking about um, a certain ingredient because they just don't like it or maybe they're actually allergic to it um, and don't want to tell you. There's um, quite a few um, studies out there that show that people might be embarrassed by their food allergies, especially when they're dining out with their peers. They don't want to be super forthcoming with that information. We have a couple examples on this slide. For someone looking to eat gluten-free, you might think, oh, that person's just following a trendy diet. But in reality, they might have a wheat allergy or celiac disease. Someone that asks to eat lactose-free, um, they could have lactose allergy, or excuse me, lactose intolerance or a milk allergy. And for those looking to eat vegan or vegetarian, there's a good chance that that's because of a religious-based diet. Um, so while that's not necessarily life or death like a food allergy, um, that still has huge implications um, for their overall well-being. Um, and all those requests should be taken seriously. So let's go into a couple more examples of how to feed the demand for guests dining out with special diets. Um, the first step or the first tip that we have is to use what you already have in-house. You don't have to come up with a million new gluten-free, dairy-free, vegetarian recipes. You'd be surprised how easy it is to tweak some of your favorites. Um, so for your sandwiches, offering gluten-free bread or lettuce wraps, um, there's a good chance that the other components are already gluten-free. Uh, same with your pasta, offering um, a gluten-free substitute. Having the dressings and sauces on the side, so maybe instead of tossing a huge batch of Caesar salad, that would be gluten-free without the dressing um, or the croutons, having that on the side and having guests add that if they want it, or it makes it really easy for your staff to use those chopped greens and cheese for a gluten-free substitute instead. Um, and meat alternatives for classic dishes, Mushrooms has probably been the biggest one we've seen recently, um, substituting a meat patty and a hamburger with a portobello mushroom. Um, eggplant is another popular one. 
Um, I actually just uh, dined out recently um, at a breakfast place in town, and instead of ham on the eggs Benedict, they offered um, eggplant rounds, which was something I hadn't seen before, but it was really good. Um, so that was interesting. And second, it's always important to know the sourcing of your ingredients. For vegetarian requests, a big one is rennet, which is an enzyme used in cheese. There are microbial and fungal sources of rennet, but there are also animal sources, and the animal does need to be slaughtered in order to obtain the rennet, um, so a lot of vegetarians will not consume cheese that um, includes rennet from those sources. There are some dough conditioners that are derived from animal hair. Um, L-cysteine is a good example of this. Um, so for someone eating a vegan diet, checking on the breads that you use, the baked goods, just to make sure that you have the sourcing of those ingredients nailed down. And cross-contact and manufacturing. This is a huge one for gluten-free and food allergy requests. Um, you may have seen uh, may contain statements on food products or produced in the same facility as um, for those top eight allergens. And this is probably the biggest reason why we, when we're doing a gluten-free review for a client, um, why a certain product isn't gluten-free. The manufacturer can't guarantee that um, either in the field where the grains were being grown, for example, a corn tortilla, they can't guarantee that the corn being used for the tortilla never commingled with barley, either in the storage facility or um, it was cut on the same equipment that the barley was used, or that they used on the barley. Um, so checking for cross-contact is important because that could cause a reaction for somebody. And then finally, make sure that your staff is staying trained. Um, special diets, like we've mentioned several times already, um, can really be serious and could be a life or death issue. So make sure that your staff knows how to properly handle those guests um, and ensures a safe dining experience. So here's another recipe revamp that we have. Um, our company is located in Colorado, and I happen to be a big Denver Broncos fan. So in honor of Peyton Manning's um, maybe questionable nationwide ads, we did a chicken parm sandwich for our recipe. So before we make any changes, we have a buttered hoagie roll, um, a breaded and pan fried chicken breast filet, marinara sauce, mozzarella, and a side of fries. To make it a little bit um, more accommodating to guests with special dietary needs, um, here are some uh, swaps that we made. So to make it gluten-free, we opted for a gluten-free roll, um, preferably one that's pre-wrapped that uh, you open up right before you use it, so that way um, you're curbing the risk of cross-contact. We're using gluten-free breadcrumbs, or a lighter option would be a grilled chicken breast. Make sure you check on the marinara sauce. There can certainly be gluten hidden in there. And for the French fries, make sure that you're using a designated fryer. If you're frying the breaded chicken or other appetizers that are breaded, um, and then the fries go in right after those, there's going to be cross-contact, and those fries aren't going to be safe for a gluten-free diner. Um, so having a designated fryer and being able to promote your fried, um, your French fries as gluten-free, uh, you'd be surprised how important that is for guests. And to make this vegetarian or vegan, um, we're going to use eggplant for chicken. Eggplant parmesan isn't something brand new to guests, so you don't have to worry about people turning up their nose at it. Looking at cheese alternatives, there are quite a few different dairy-free cheeses out there um, made with tree nuts, so again, be careful with allergens there. Um, soy cheese, there are a couple different options that you can offer to guests. Um, and check for milk in the marinara. We see that quite a bit as a food allergy um, listed in marinara sauce. So just, again, knowing the sourcing of your ingredients and knowing what's in your food products. Okay, and the last section that we're going to cover here um, is the focus of guest opinions on health and wellness turning to ingredients opposed to certain nutrients. And we've seen a huge increase in the number of guest inquiries over the past few years um, regarding certain additives or ingredients in food. So here's our last poll question. So again, if you wouldn't mind typing into the chat box, um, what ingredients do you get asked about the most at your food service establishment? So is your food free from X? Um, or, as a consumer, what are some ingredients that you like to avoid when you dine out? And we're starting to get quite a few answers here. Uh, carrageenan, red dye, GMOs, 
gluten, where is your meat coming from, dairy, soy, eggs, so a lot of the top eight allergens, um, GMOs, processed grains, GMOs, okay, so GMOs are pretty popular there, which is a great transition to our next slide. Um, consumers are now starting to focus on the entire lifespan of their food, so starting with the planting in the fields for grains, fruits, and vegetables, um, and then for their meat, eggs, and dairy, knowing how the animals were raised and what that process looked like. So as I put together the slides, I think these are probably the most staggering statistics that I saw. Um, a Gallup poll from 2014 found that 45% of consumers are looking um, for organic food when they dine out. And for GMOs, a Health Focus International poll from 2015 found that 87% of consumers think that non-GMO foods are, are somewhat or a lot healthier um, than their GMO counterparts. And I think this is um, important to note that the scientific community, you wouldn't find these same statistics. Um, GMOs are regarded as safe by the scientific community by a lot of different organizations, um, but consumers still are questioning, should I be eating this? Is this good for the environment? Um, those are a lot of questions running through their head as they start to think about dining out, and these are questions that you might receive as well. So the mindset that I've seen, um, and I'm sure you've all seen over the past couple years, is that the shorter the ingredient list, the better. Um, and another thing that I've seen is the easier to pronounce the words in the ingredient list, the better, um, which is an interesting mindset to have, but definitely one that consumers are thinking about. Um, so there are a lot of additives and artificial ingredients that are getting a really bad rap. Um, flavors and colors, colors especially, uh, the bill was recently introduced in California um, to include warning labels on foods that contain artificial colors, um, going along with quite a few other warning levels, labels excuse me, that California has. Um, other ingredients include MSG, BHA, BHT, and TBHQ. Those have um, really been ones that we've been asked about recently. Um, it seems like we've been getting almost a question a day about those three additives. Again, as more research comes out or um, the food bloggers like Food Babe or Dr. Oz start to talk about these ingredients, you can really tell uh, based on the questions that we've been getting from guests. Um, partially hydrogenated oils, this one's going to clear itself up in a couple of years when the FDA removes the generally recognized as safe distinction. Um, and high fructose corn syrup, that's a big one that we've been asked about recently. Uh, consumers are really concerned with these ingredients being in their food. So a big area of marketing over the past few years has been uh, revolving around promoting the absence of additives in food. Um, so, so Chipotle is a big, or excuse me, not Chipotle, um, Panera is that top banner, and they're now promoting that 100% of our food is 100% clean. You may be familiar with their no-no list, which is a pretty expansive list of additives that they don't allow in their food. Um, a couple, uh, oh gosh, was it years ago? Um, there was the drama over the azodicarbinamide, which is a dough conditioner, um, you might remember Food Babe, the food blogger, taking a bite out of a yoga mat and saying that's what it's like to eat Subway's bread. And as a result, um, Subway and a few other restaurants have decided to remove that from their baked goods. McDonald's is making changes to their McNuggets, um, looking to uh, promote those to parents with young children, um, saying that you know this food is better for your child. It has less of those controversial ingredients in it. Um, and then Taco Bell is another one where they've been making um, some decisions to remove certain ingredients from their food. So going back to that Nielsen survey, um, here's some results to a couple of questions that they asked about ingredients and how our food is grown and processed. Um, going back to the length of the ingredient list, that bottom right question, you can see that 61% of North American consumers think that the shorter the ingredient list, the more healthful the food or beverage, um, which again is an interesting concept that's come up just recently. Um, I want to know everything that's going into my food, 67% of North American consumers. Um, there's a lot uh, to take in here, but um, the overall message is that consumers want transparency in their food. They want to know what they're eating. 
um, and those questions are ultimately going to be delivered to you as food service operators. Okay, so when it comes to this ever-growing ever -growing group of people that are focused on ingredient lists, um, kind of as the needle of their health compass, the first place to start is with your supply chain. Um, so you can't make any claims like free from high fructose corn syrup, free from artificial colors, if you don't know where your food is coming from or if you don't have your supply nailed down. Next is to set priorities. Uh, eliminating all of these additives, preservatives, colors, whatever it may be from your food, that's not something that you're going to do overnight, and it's not something that these other big brands have been doing overnight. They've been forthcoming with their timeline, um, which is another bullet here, um, saying that by X date we'll have removed high fructose corn syrup, by six months later we'll reduce um, the number of products that contain MSG, and so on and so forth. And consumers have really been uh, responding well to that. So even though they aren't getting the immediate results that they want, they like knowing that um, the establishment has a plan in place and they know exactly what's going to be in their food later on down the line. Um, if you've got it, flaunt it. So if you already have menu items that are free from some of those controversial additives or maybe you want to promote that you have um, meat and poultry that was raised without the use of antibiotics or hormones or whatever your consumers are looking for that you want to promote, um, you can go ahead and promote those single line items while you work on the rest of your menu. Um, there's no reason why you need to wait until everything's 100% clean until you decide to make marketing claims. Um, as long as you're being truthful to the consumer, um, then there's no reason to highlight some of those um, things that you've already accomplished with your menu. And then know your demographic. And I'll go ahead and switch to this slide. Um, so not every consumer will have the same concerns when it comes to dining out. If you have um, more millennials dining in at your restaurants, they're going to have different concerns um, than some of you know, baby boomers and on who are going to be more focused on specific nutrients opposed to you know, every ingredient that's in their food. So who frequents your establishments the most? Um, it's important to listen to what your guests are asking for and maybe what they're willing to pay a little bit more um, for. So if you have maybe an older population that's dining in, um, you know, spending all this money and time to eliminate all these artificial ingredients from your menu isn't going to have as big of an impact as it would on an establishment that serves mostly millennials. So again, knowing who your consumers are and what they're uh, looking for in their food is really important. Okay, so after going through all of this, um, we've looked at a handful of approaches to healthy dining. Um, do we really have an answer for what healthy means? Um, and we can't give you an exact answer for what's healthy or what you can promote that's healthy, but we can tell you that the most important thing to keep in mind as you start looking at making some health claims is that transparency is key. Consumers are demanding transparency in their food more than ever. 94% um, of consumers will be more loyal to a brand that's completely transparent, so that's a pretty huge number right there. Um, and 73% of consumers are willing to pay more for a product that's transparent. So this is no longer an option for today's diner. Um, if you're calling something better for you, then you're going to need to be able to back that up. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the lawsuits mentioned here, um, and there are dozens more that are going on at any given time. But consumers are becoming hyper aware to misleading claims and they're not afraid to bring forth legal action if they aren't being handled appropriately. Um, so Chipotle um, started marketing their food as GMO free and you know, within a couple of months they were hit with their first lawsuit. Um, Dole, I know this isn't food service, it's retail, but um, they were hit with a lawsuit over their natural claims, saying that their foods weren't actually natural. And then something that just happened last week, Naked Juice is changing their labels after um, accusations that they're misleading. So calling something a kale juice, but then kale is the fourth ingredient on the label. Consumers are paying attention to all of this, and they're really expecting um, that for food service establishments, um, anywhere where they're getting their food, that all of the claims that they're seeing are truthful um, and that they don't have to question where this information is coming from. Um, so heed our warning, don't make any claims that you can't back up, and don't use claims like healthy, um, better for you, natural, um, too loosely. 
because there could be some serious issues with your um, with consumers and you could be hearing about that later down the line. Okay, and with that really uplifting slide, I'm going to hand it back over to Lori. Great. Thank you, Claire. We've been writing down those of you that have posed some questions, and we will get to those in just a couple minutes. But before we do, we wanted to share our next webinar topic with you. Coming your way March 28th is a very important webinar entitled, It's the Law. This is all about knowing current food allergy legislation. And when we requested topics for our 2017 educational webinar series, this was by far the most popular answer we received, so we're excited to bring this to you. In this webinar, you're going to learn about the legal implications of food allergens, current laws, and proposed legislation surrounding food allergies. And our special guest speaker will be Ryan Gimbala, who chairs the Food and Beverage Industry Practice Group at the law firm of O'Toole, McLaughlin, Dooley, and Pecora in Cleveland, Ohio. Mr. Gambala has been an industry leader in understanding the requirements, nuance, and consequences of the Food Safety Modernization Act and the corresponding federal regulations. His work includes regulatory compliance and consulting, federal investigation and audit response, and litigation. With Ryan's help, we'll take a deeper look into Good Samaritan laws and best due diligence for your brand. So we hope you will attend that. And just like all of our 2017 educational webinar series, uh, this webinar is approved for one continu continuing education unit at level two through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And there will be a registration link in the post-meeting email um, you will receive later today, so be sure to register for this exciting event. And finally, just to recap before we get into the questions, here are some suggestions that we have after today's webinar. The first is to fill out the survey that will be hitting your email once we sign off here. We do take your comments and criticisms to heart and want to know what we did well and what we should do better, so please hit us with your honest feedback. And for those of you on the call who are interested in continuing education credits from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the post-meeting email will also contain a completed proof of attendance that you can submit to the Academy to redeem those hours. And finally, to stay up with current news, legislation, and more, sign up for our newsletter at menutrinfo.com. With all the potential changes coming to the food industry this year, this will be a great resource for you and your brand. And so at this time, we'd like to go ahead and answer the questions that we've been rece receiving during the webinar today. So the first question is, will all businesses require menu labeling, or is there a specific number of seats that is required? Okay, um, great question. So menu labeling, um, again, the enforcement date is May 5th of this year, and any food service establishment, so restaurants, grocery stores, convenience stores, movie theaters, amusement parks, anyone selling restaurant type food um, that you can eat immediately or take it somewhere and then eat it, um, so prepared, ready to consume food. Um, if you have more than 20 locations nationwide, then you will be covered by the regulations. Um, you'll need to post calories adjacent to the name or price of your menu items for all of your standard menu items, um, and then have additional nutrition information available upon request. Great. Um, and another question along those same lines was, are the parameters of, or, sorry, what are the parameters of who has to do menu labeling? Great. Um, so, yeah, like I said, the establishments that are serving restaurant type food, um, so hot, prepared, something that they consume either immediately, um, you know, or take it home and consume it, um, and have more than 20 locations, then those are the establishments that are covered. And are retail units and collegiate dining services required to have calories listed on their menu board? Um, so that's a question that we've been getting quite a bit, um, and it goes back to um, whether or not there are 20 locations um, doing business under the same name and selling substantially the same menu items. Um, so you'll have to look at your internal organization and see, um, you know, do I have 20 or more of um, Colorado State University Cafe um, or is everything called out differently to the guests, um, and are they serving different menu items? So uh, the most important thing I'd say would be to look at um, the layout and organization of your different locations across campus um, and see if there are 20 that fall under those same cr uh, criteria. Great. 
Any thoughts about navigating an increased demand for organic and GMO-free, <coughs> even though science shows GMOs and non-organic to be completely safe? Sure. Um, so GMOs and organic, those are things that um, are relatively new to us. We haven't been asked about them um, probably until this past year or so. Um, but I think it goes back to knowing who your consumers are. So um, millennials are probably going to be a little bit more concerned with those things and maybe some of the older populations, not trying to generalize, but just what the um, studies show. So knowing, number one, if there's going to be a return on your investment, if guests are really going to flock to your establishment because you've made those changes or if, you know, maybe there are some better uses of your time when it comes to sourcing. Um, and then, again, going with setting priorities, so maybe focusing on nailing down your meat and poultry supply, so being able to say, you know, everything here is antibiotic free, um, starting there and then going into, you know, all of our root vegetables are organic or, you know, whatever you're being asked about. So not checking every box all at once, but making a concise plan and knowing that by X date we'll have this accomplished. I think that's important. Do you anticipate any changes to the timing of this with the new administration in the federal government? That was a big question that we had at the beginning of this year, but we really haven't gotten any hints or, um, you know, we don't think that things are going to be changing with the menu labeling timeline. Um, the administration, they did put a target on the Affordable Care Act. Um, menu labeling was part of the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> But we haven't gotten any kind of um, suggestion that it will be um, eliminated within the next 66 days. At this point, restaurants are so far down the line, um, or at least they should be so far down the line, um, and they're spending um, a considerable amount of money not only to get their analysis done correctly, but also to print all these new materials for their uh, stores. So um, again, we don't have a crystal ball, but our guess is that, no, there's not going to be a change before May 5th. Great. We're receiving a lot of great questions, so thank you guys for submitting these. Can you please clarify what a serving means for a buffet food? Should we use the scoop size to determine serving size? Sure. Um, so for self-service food or food on display, um, as defined by the FDA and the menu labeling regulations, um, you need to list the calories and um, the associated serving size for those items. So if you have things on your buffet that it, it's a discrete unit like a muffin or a grilled chicken breast or a slice of pizza, you can label the calories per one unit. Um, if you don't have that option and you have like um, salad dressings or prepared salads where it's being served with a ladle or a scoop, then you can provide the calories based on the serving utensil. Um, so if I have a one fluid ounce scoop for my salad dressing, I can base um, the calorie information on one scoop. You just need to make sure that those utensils are um, dishing out a uniform amount of food, um, so you can't use tongs or something like that. Um, if you have utensils like tongs where the guest isn't given a uniform amount of food each time, then you can use household measurements, so cups, tablespoons. Um, and if you're serving the food by weight, like a salad bar by pound, then you can um, list the calorie information by weight, so four ounces, an ounce. Um, whatever your units may be. Great. Um, do you need to label self-serve things in retail locations like half and half at an on-campus Starbucks? So the half and half is an interesting example. Um, the FDA has an exemption for um, condiments for general use. So these would be things like the half and half um, being left out at a Starbucks. No matter what item the guest purchases, they can walk over to that stand and use the half and half. Um, this would be the same with like ketchup pumps or mustard packets, um, things that are out on the table like um, pancake syrup, um, all those things that a guest can use no matter what they're ordering. Those are exempt from menu labeling. So no, they would not need to have calories listed. Great. Um, any idea how many retail food providers are using RDs to conduct their menu analysis to provide nutrition to the public? And basically, how can you know what you see is accurate? That's a great question. Um, and I, I cannot provide a number um, for the um, numbers of food providers using RDs to conduct their analysis. 
Um, I know that there are numerous um, food service establishments that have in-house RDs um, to help answer guest questions and to um, uh, conduct the analysis of their menu items. The FDA in the menu labeling regulations, they did give a list of um, approved ways to obtain your nutrition information, um, whether that's database analysis, which is what we do at MenuTrinfo, laboratory analysis, um, if you use a cookbook and you follow a recipe exactly and it has posted nutrition information, you can use that, um, using nutrition labels from uh, purchased foods, um, or a combination of those means. As long as there's a reasonable basis behind your posted nutrition numbers, that's what the FDA is looking for. Um, and there are two levels of certification required through menu labeling. Um, and the first is coming from the corporate office, um, wherever or whoever was in charge of the nutritional analysis. Um, and the certification is saying that um, this is the reasonable basis behind our numbers. So for one of our clients, they would say, we use third-party menu Trinfo to complete our analysis. And then um, there's a whole list of information that we would therefore supply to the FDA to prove that our analysis was accurate. Um, the second certification comes from each individual store level, and they're certifying that all of um, the factors that went into the nutritional analysis, so quantities of ingredients, specific ingredients, um, procedures, that those are all being followed at the store level um, and therefore validating the nutritional analysis that was done. Um, so those are two um, pieces to hopefully um, encourage consumers to trust the nutrition information um, and encourage food service operators to take their analysis seriously. Great. I think we have time for just one or two final questions here. Um, does the FDA define natural? That's a great one. Um, in probably the majority of the lawsuits that we see revolve around the term natural. Um, the FDA does not provide it. They are working on a definition. Um, so we tend to advise people against using that claim since it doesn't have a solid definition, um, but rather focusing on specific ingredients. So our food is free from artificial colors or our food is free from artificial flavors, um, opposed to using the term natural, which um, has a high possibility of getting you in trouble. <laughs> Great. OK, final question here. Aren't gluten-free and wheat-free the same thing? Um, so this is one that we get quite a bit, um, and everything that's gluten-free should be wheat-free, um, but everything that's wheat-free is not necessarily gluten-free. Um, so gluten, um, it's more than just wheat. There's rye, barley, and then crossbreeds between those different um, grains. So if you're saying that something is wheat-free on your menu, that's not necessarily calling it gluten-free, um, and guests might ask you to go that one step further and check for those additional grains. Great. Okay, everyone, it's time to wrap up the webinar. If we happen to overlook your question, we will, um, we will find that and we will get back to you with a response. Um, thank you for your time and have a great day.